Chapter 5 Monday morning found Tom miserable, as every Monday morning did. It began another week's slow suffering in school. Tom generally began Mondays wishing that he had not enjoyed a holiday. Holidays just made returning to captivity more unbearable. Tom lay thinking, if he were sick, he could stay home from school. He checked his system, but found no ailment. Then he discovered that one of his upper front teeth was loose. He was about to start groaning when it occurred to him that if he went to his aunt saying he had a loose tooth, she simply would pull it out and that would hurt. So he decided to hold the tooth in reserve. After a while, he remembered that he had a sore toe, so he started groaning. Sid slept on. Tom groaned louder. No reaction from Sid. Tom gave a series of admirable groans. Sid snored on. Tom was aggravated. Sid! Sid! He shook Sid. This worked. Tom resumed his groaning. Sid yawned and stretched, brought himself up on his elbow, and stared at Tom, who kept groaning. Tom! Say, Tom! No response. Tom, what's the matter? Sid, su Sid shook Tom and looked into his face anxiously. Tom moaned. Don't, Sid. Don't joggle me. Why? What's the matter? I'll call Auntie. No, it'll be over soon, maybe. Don't call anybody. I have to. How long have you been like this? Hours. Ouch! Don't stir so much, Sid. You'll kill me. Why didn't you wake me sooner? What is the matter? I forgive you everything, Sid. Oh, everything you've ever done to me. When I'm gone... Oh, Tom, you ain't dying, are you? Maybe give my one-eyed cat to the new girl that's come to town. Tell her. But Sid had snatched his clothes and gone. He flew downstairs. Aunt Polly, come. Tom's dying. Dying? Yes, come quick. Rubbish. I don't believe it. But she hurried upstairs with Sid and Mary at her heels. When she reached the bed, she cried, Tom, what's the matter with you? Oh, Auntie, I'm... What's the matter with you? My sore toe. Aunt Polly sank into a chair and laughed a little, cried a little, and did both together a little. This restored her. Tom, what a turn you gave me. Now you stop this nonsense. The groans ceased. Aunt Polly, it hurt so much that I didn't mind my tooth. Your tooth indeed. What's the matter with your tooth? It's loose and it aches awful. Don't begin that groaning again. Open your mouth. Well, your tooth is loose, but you're not going to die from it. Mary, get me some thread and a hot chunk from the fire. Oh, please don't pull it out, Auntie, Tom said. It don't hurt any more. I swear it don't. Please don't. Auntie, I don't want to have to stay home from school. Oh, you don't, don't you? So all this row was because you thought you'd get to stay home from school and go fishing? Tom, you seem to try every way you can to break my old heart. The dental instruments were ready. Aunt Polly fastened one end of the thread to Tom's tooth and the other to the bedpost. Then she seized the fiery chunk and thrust it almost into Tom's face. The tooth hung dangling by the bedpost. But all trials bring compensations. As Tom headed to school after breakfast, he was the envy of every boy he met because the gap in his teeth enabled him to spit in a new and admirable way. He gathered quite a following of lads interested in the exhibition. Tom soon encountered the town's young outcast, Huckleberry Finn, son of the town drunkard. Huckleberry was hated by all the mothers of the town because he was idle, lawless, vulgar, and bad, and because their children admired him, delighted in his forbidden society, and wished they dared to be like him. Like the other boys, Tom was under strict orders not to play with Huckleberry, so he played with him every chance he got. Huckleberry always dressed in men's cast-off rags. His hat was a ruin with a wide crescent lopped out of it lopped out of its brim. His coat, when he wore one, hung nearly to his heels. Only one suspender supported his trousers, whose seat bagged low and whose fringed legs dragged in the dirt when they weren't rolled up. Huckleberry came and went as he chose. He slept on doorsteps in fine weather and in empty barrels in wet weather. He didn't have to go to school or church or obey anyone. He could go fishing or swimming when and where he chose and stayed as long as he liked. No one forbade him to fight. He could stay up as late as he pleased. He always was the first boy to go barefoot in the spring and the last to wear shoes in the fall. He never had to wash or put on clean clothes. He could swear wonderfully. In a word, he had everything that makes life precious. So thought every harassed, hampered, respectable boy in St. Petersburg. Tom hailed the romantic outcast. Hello, Huck. Hello. What's that you've got, dead cat? Let me see. He's pretty stiff. Where'd you get him? Bought him off a boy. What did you give? A blue ticket and a bladder that I got at the slaughterhouse. Where'd you get the blue ticket? Bought it off Ben Rogers two weeks ago. What is dead cats good for? Cure warts with. Really, I know something that's better. What? Stump water, Tom said. 
Stump water? I wouldn't give a darn for stump water. Did you ever try it? No, but Bob Tanner did. Who told you so? Bob and Davy Thatcher, and Davy told Johnny Baker, and Johnny told Jim Hollis, and Jim told Ben Rogers, and Ben told me. Well, what of it? They all lie. Tell me how Bob Tanner done it, Tom said. He dipped his hand in a rotten stump, where the rainwater was. In the daytime? Yes. With his face to the stump? Yes, at least I reckon so. Did he say anything? I don't know. Aha! You can't cure warts with stump water in such a fool way. You've got to go alone, into the woods, where there's a stump with rainwater. Right at midnight, you back up against the stump, jam your hand in and say, Barley corn, barley corn, spells of all sorts. Stump water, stump water, swallow these warts, and then walk away quick, eleven steps, with your eyes shut, and then turn around three times and walk home without speaking to anybody. If you speak, the charm's busted. Well, that sounds like a good way, but that ain't the way Bob Tanner done it. You can bet he didn't, because he's the wartiest boy in this town. He wouldn't have a wart on him if he'd know how to work stump water. I've took thousands of warts off my hands that way. But say, how do you cure them with dead cats? Why, you take your cat and go to the graveyard after somebody wicked has been buried. You go about midnight when a devil will come, or maybe two or three. You can't see him, you only hear him, something like the wind, or maybe hear him talk. When the devils are talking, the wicked per taking the wicked person away, you heave your cat at him and say, Devil follow corpse, cat follow devil, warts follow cat. I'm done with ye. That'll fetch any wart. Sounds right. Did you ever try it? No, but old Mother Hopkins told me. Well, I reckon it's so then, because they say she's a witch. I know she is. She witched Pap. Pap says so his own self. He came along one day, and he seen she was a witch in him, so he took up a rock. If she hadn't dodged, he would have got her. That very night, he rolled off a shed where he was laying, drunk, and broke his arm. How did he know she was a witch in him? Pap can tell. Pap says when they keep looking right at you, they're a witch in you. Especially if they mumble, because when they mumble, they're saying the Lord's Prayer backwards. Say, Huck, when you going to try the cat? Tonight, I reckon. Devils will come after old Hoss Williams tonight. But they buried him Saturday. Didn't the devils get him Saturday night? How you talk? How could their charms work before midnight? And then, it's Sunday. Devils don't hang around much on Sunday, I reckon. That's so. Can I go with you? Of course, if you ain't afeard. Afeard ain't likely. Will you meow? Yes, and you meow back if you get a chance. Last time you kept me meowing until old Hayes went to throwing rocks at me saying, Dern that cat. I threw a brick right through his window. Don't tell. I won't. I couldn't meow that night because Auntie was watching me, but I'll meow this time. The boys parted and Tom continued on his way. When he reached the little schoolhouse, he strode in, hung his hat on a peg, and flung himself into his seat. Enthroned in his great armchair, the schoolmaster, Silas Dobbins, was dozing. The interruption roused him. Thomas Sawyer! Tom knew that hearing his full name meant trouble. Sir? Come up here. Why are you late again? Tom was about to lie when he saw two long tails of blonde hair hanging down a back that he recognized by the electric sympathy of love. Next to that form was the only vacant place on the girl's side of the schoolhouse. Tom instantly said, I stopped to talk with Huckleberry Finn. Dobbin's pulse stopped, and he stared. The buzz of study ceased. The pupils wondered if this foolhardy boy had lost his mind. Dobbins asked, You did what? Stop the talk with Huckleberry Finn. Thomas Sawyer, this is the most astounding confession I have ever heard. Take off your jacket. Dobbins hit time, Tom with switches until his arm was tired, and his supply of switches was noticeably diminished. Now, sir, go and sit with the girls, and let this be a warning to you. Titters rippled around the room, but Tom sat down next to his idol. The girl looked away with a toss of her head. Nudges, winks, and whispers traveled the room. Tom sat still, with his arms on the long, low desk before him, and seemed to study his book. The usual murmur of students soon resumed, and Tom began to steal glances at the girl. She noticed his glances, made a face at him, and gave him the back of her head. When she cautiously faced around again, a peach lay before her. She thrust it away. Tom gently put it back. She thrust it away again, but with less hostility. Tom patiently returned it to its place. She let it remain. Tom scrawled on his slate, Please take it. I got more. The girl glanced at the words, but made no sign. Tom began to draw on the slate, hiding his work with his left hand. For a time, the girl refused to notice, but then she whispered, Let me see it. Tom partly uncovered a dismal caricature of a house with a corkscrew of smoke issuing from the chimney. The girl's interest fastened onto the work. 
When it was finished, the girl gazed a moment, then whispered, It's nice. Draw a man. The artist directed a man in the front yard who looked like an oil tower. He could have stepped over the house, but the girl was not hypercritical. She whispered, It's a beautiful man. I wish I could draw. It's easy, Tom whispered. I'll learn you. Oh, will you? When? At noon. Do you go home for lunch? I'll stay if you will. Good. What's your name? Becky Thatcher. What's yours? Oh, I know. It's Thomas Sawyer. That's the name they lick me by. I'm Tom when I'm good. Call me Tom, all right? Yes. Tom began to scrawl in the slate, hiding the words from Becky. She begged to see. Tom said, oh, it ain't anything. Please let me see. Becky put her small hand on his, and a little scuffle followed, with Tom pretending to resist but letting his hand slip until these words were revealed. I love you. Oh, you bad thing. She gave his hand a smart rap, but reddened and looked pleased. Just then, Tom was gripped and lifted by his ear. In that vice, he was borne across the room and deposited in his own seat under a barrage of student giggles. Dobbins stood over him a few awful moments, then returned to his throne without a word. Although Tom's ear tingled, Tom's heart rejoiced. As the students quieted, Tom made an honest effort to study, but the turmoil within him was too great. When his turn came to read, he botched the job. In geography class, he turned lakes into mountains, mountains into rivers, and rivers into continents. In spelling class, he missed baby words and was forced to relinquish the pewter spelling medal that he had worn conspicuously for months. When school broke up at noon, Tom flew to Becky and whispered into her ear, Put on your bonnet and let on you're going home. When you get to the corner, give the rest of them the slip. Turn down through the lane and come back. I'll go the other way. So Becky went off with one group of students and Tom with another. In a little while, the two met at the bottom of the lane. When they reached the school, they had it all to themselves. They sat together with the slate before them, and Tom gave Becky the pencil and held her hand in his, guiding it, and so created another house. When the interest in art began to wane, the two fell to talking. Do you like rats? Tom asked. No. I mean dead ones to swing around your head with a string. No, what I like is chewing gum. I should say so. I wish I had some now. I've got some. I'll let you chew it a while, but you must give it back to me. That was agreeable, so they took turns chewing it and dangled their legs against the bench in an excess of contentment. Was you ever at a circus? Tom asked. Yes, and my pa's going to take me again sometime, if I'm good. I've been to the circus three or four times. Church ain't shucks to a circus. When I grow up, I'm going to be a circus clown. Are you? That will be nice. They're lovely. Yes, and they get loads of money, almost a dollar a day, Ben Rogers says. Say, Becky, was you ever engaged? What's that? Engaged to be married. No. Would you like to be? I don't know. What's it like? Why, it ain't like anything. You just tell a boy you won't ever have anybody but him. Then you kiss, and that's all. Anybody can do it. What do you kiss for? Why, that's too... Well, they always do that. Everybody? Yes, everybody that's in love with each other. Do you remember what I wrote on the slate? I'll whisper it. Becky hesitated, but Tom took silence for consent. He put his arm around her waist and whispered with his mouth closed mouth close to her ear. Now you whisper it to me. She resisted a while, then said, turn your face away so you can't see. You mustn't ever tell anybody. You won't, will you? No, indeed. Tom turned his face away. Becky bent timidly around until her breath stirred his curls and whispered, I love you. Then she sprang away and ran around and around the desks and benches with Tom after her. At last, she took refuge in a corner with her little white apron to her face. Tom clasped her around her neck and said, it's all done now, Becky, except for the kiss. Don't be afraid of that. It ain't anything at all. Please, Becky. He tugged at her apron and hands. Her hands dropped. Her face, glowing with the struggle, came up and submitted. Tom kissed her red lips. Now it's all done, Becky. After this, you ain't ever to love or marry anybody but me. Never, ever. I'll never love or marry anybody but you, Tom. And you ain't ever to marry anybody but me. Of course, that's part of it. And whenever we come to school or go home, you're to walk with me. When there ain't anybody looking. And you choose me, and I choose you at parties, because that's what you do when you're engaged. It's nice. I never heard of it before. It's ever so gay. Why, me and Amy Lawrence... Becky's big eyes told Tom his blunder. Oh, Tom, I ain't the first girl you've been engaged to? Becky began to cry. Don't cry, Becky. I don't care for her anymore. Tom tried to put his arm around her neck. But she pushed him away and turned her face to the wall. Tom tried again, with soothing words, and again was rejected. Then his pride was up. He strode away and went outside. Tom stood a while, restless and uneasy, periodically glancing at the door, hoping that Becky would repent and come to find him. She didn't. Then he began to fear that he was in the wrong, so he went back in. 
Becky still was standing in the corner with her face to the wall. Tom went to her and stood a moment, not knowing how to proceed. Becky, I... I don't care for anybody but you. No reply. Becky, won't you say something? No. Tom got out his most prized possession, a brass knob from the top of an Andy iron, and passed it around her so that she could see it. Please, Becky, won't you take it? Becky knocked it to the floor. Tom marched out. Becky soon ran to the door and around the playground. Tom wasn't in sight. She called, Tom, Tom. No answer. When the other pupils returned, minus Tom, Becky ached with regret.